We're live on location at Stanford University, and joining me today is an economist, author, scholar, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and living legend, Dr. Thomas Sowell. Welcome to the Rubin Report. Well, thank you. Good to be with you. I feel I have to get the gushing out first. That way we can focus on the book. I don't know that there's anyone on this mortal coil whose writing and thinking has influenced me more than you. So this, this is truly an honor for me, and I just have to get that out right at the beginning. I just hope I haven't misled you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. I'll let you know at the end. Um, so first, I thought I want to do a little bit on your history, and I want to focus on your new book. Um, but I was curious if you have a sense of the sort of renaissance that your writing is having right now with young people. Because when I tweeted out that we finally had you on the show, and we've been trying to make this happen for quite some time, I mean thousands of responses. And I had tons of people just say, please tell him this, tell him this. My awakening was because of Dr. Sal, all of this. Are you noticing something happening right now because of the unique place where I only know what people tell me. <laughs> That's even true at Stanford. Yeah. Uh, I only know what my, my research assistants tell me. All right, well, I'll, <laughs> I will certainly accept that. Well, take my word for it then. Uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, your history for a bit and then we'll, then we'll move on to your new book. Uh, born North Carolina, yes. grew up in the Bronx. In Harlem. In, in Harlem, sorry, in Harlem. Uh, tell me a little bit about some of your, your formative years. Well, you know, I, I thought about it as I was doing the research for the first chapter where I get into the birth order thing. Now, had my, uh, my parents uh, lived a normal lifespan, I would have been the sixth child in the family. They died young, and so I was adopted in infancy uh, in a family, as an only child, raised as an only child in a home with four adults. And uh, in terms of what, what I found in the, re about the research uh, on birth order, clearly that was a huge advantage. Uh, and so their misfortune uh, was my good fortune. And moreover, the family in which I was raised moved to New York, which at that time had a far superior uh, educational system for that in, in North Carolina, and far superior to what it is today. Were you always interested in education? I mean, even as a young no. person? No, I mean, a kid, little kid, there was nothing in my background that would have done, put, put me there. Uh, but fortunately, in, in Harlem, there was a kid named Eddie that uh, members of the family had run into before I ever arrived from North Carolina. And he was a very, uh, came from a highly educated family. Uh, and they uh, immediately saw the implications if they, if they could get him to, uh, to, to sort of mentor me. And uh, now, had I had met Eddie on my own, chances are I would never have seen any significance. Uh, he would just have been one of the people I passed by. But of course, the, uh, the, the, the adults understood what the future was like and, and thinking about things that kids don't think about, uh, despite the great... Uh, worship of, ch of, of, of child talkers these days. <laughs> uh, and so, but, so he, he took me to a public library and I had no idea what a public library was. Wow. I was eight years old and I saw all these books and I had no idea why we were there when I didn't have any money to buy one book. And so what am I gonna do with all these you know, hundreds of books up on the shelf? And he very patiently walked me through the whole thing. And again, I was very reluctant to take out a library card because I didn't know what, what all this is about. But he was, talked me into it, and I, and I borrowed a couple of books. And really, had I not encountered him, the, the entire rest of the story could not have been the way it was. I mean, at some point, I would have learned what a public library uh, was. But by that point, it would be too late. Yeah. I mean, if you, when you start getting in the habit of, of reading when you're eight years old, uh, that, that's a different ball game than if you have to wait till you're a teenager and it's too late now. Dare I ask if you have any recollection what you might have taken out of the library at eight years old? Uh, one of the books was the Dr. Doolittle books. Uh, I don't know if you even know what those are. He, he could talk to the animals. Yep. A Alice in Wonderland and uh, the rest of them. But uh, I, I came in on May and there wasn't, school wasn't open until September, so I had no one to play with and I was just bored to tears. Mm -hmm. And so I started reading really for the first time, and I got the habit of reading. And on that, you know, that made the rest possible. Yeah, were there any other formative things that happened to you over those, those younger years? 
Yes, the same, the same fellow was uh, very knowledgeable about, all about the school system. So when I finished elementary school and they assigned me to a junior high school in a very bad uh, neighborhood, he told me that you, you can get transferred. And I, in fact, got transferred to a much better school. Uh, had I gone to that other school, uh, I, again, the story would have been entirely different. Uh, and I, one, of the, one of the themes of the early part of the book here is that there are, there are a whole number of things that have to come together. And if you don't have all of those prerequisites, then all the whatever good qualities you have don't matter. And I mentioned illiteracy that, uh, you know, in the middle of the 20th century, uh, something like 40% of the adults in the world were still illiterate. And so it doesn't matter what their native talent or any of that came along. You can't read. There are a whole lot of uh, occupations you just simply can't get into. Yeah. So it's pretty clear from all the, the reading of yours that I've done. You, you put basic, education basically is number one, right? I mean, is that the number one thing that you can do as, as a human being? Get educated? I guess, although I wouldn't carry it too far because some of the most... Uh, disastrous notions in the world have come from highly educated people with, I'm sure, high IQs. So perhaps critical thinking with a little education. Oh, uh, I, I, am, uh, uh, I will settle for almost any kind of thinking. Yeah. <laughs> it's so rare these days. <laughs> it, it is oddly rare. So uh, one of the things that I found out that was sort of amazing about your history, you, you briefly mentioned it right before we started, you were a Marxist at one time in your life. Most people will find this hard to believe, but it is true. But it's not that unusual. Uh, most of the, of the leading conservative uh, thinkers of our ta time uh, did not start off as conservative. You had a couple like uh, Bill Buckley and uh, George Will. But I mean, Milton Friedman was, was, a, was a liberal and a Keynesian. Uh, Hayek was a socialist. Ronald Reagan was so far left, at one point the FBI was following him, you know? Uh, so, uh, so there's a huge movement uh, from the left to the right as people get older. Yeah, I'm, I'm well aware, as I mentioned to you earlier, as a former progressive, I, I understand that, that movement in the yeah. modern sense. Do you, do you remember sort of what you were thinking, what appealed to you at that time about Marxism? Yes, I mean, there was no alternative being discussed. Uh, my first job was as a Western Union messenger. And uh, I would come home on some nights, I would take the Fifth Avenue bus, which cost all of 15 cents in those days. <laughs> But I figured I'd splurge now and then. And I would drive, it would go all the way up Fifth Avenue, pass all these Lord and Taylor and uh, all these fancy uh, places. And then I would cross 57th Street, past Carnegie Hall, and down Riverside Drive, and that was the, the, sort of the Gold Coast area. And then the, as I came across this long viaduct in, that turned into 135th Street, suddenly there were the tenements. And I wondered, why is this? I mean, it's so, it's, so, it's so different. And, and nothing in the schools or in most of the books uh, seemed to deal with that. And Marx dealt with that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's like winning an election when there's only one person running. So then what was your wake up to what was wrong with that line of thinking? Uh, facts. <laughs> well, you know, we could probably end the interview right there. Yeah, facts, yeah, there you and, go. And, yeah. and specifically, my, my first uh, professional job, I was a... Uh, uh, summer intern at the U.S. Department of Labor. And I realized from dealing with these people that the U.S. Department of Labor, one of my biggest concerns was about minimum wages. It mm -hmm. has been for a long time. And so my, 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 at first I thought, well, this is good because all these people are poor and they'll get a little higher income. And so that, that'll, that'll be helpful. And then uh, as I studied economics, I began to see, well, there's a downside. They may lose their jobs completely. So it was, that, that is that. And so I tried, I, when I was at the Labor Department, I tried to uh, t talk about that to them. And eventually I came up with some test of it. And uh, uh, when I came up with this test, how we might test this, I was waiting to hear congratulations, you see, that I had this. <laughs> and I could see these people were stunned. They said, oh, this, this idiot has stumbled on something that will ruin us all. Wow. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I realized the U.S. Department of Labor had its uh, own agenda and interests. Uh, and that did necess not necessarily mean that, that whether poor people lost their jobs from minimum wages or got higher pay was their highest priority. Yeah, how much longer did you last at the no, that, that No, that was really the turning point. Yeah. And then I began to see that all these government agencies and whatnot, they have their own institutional incentives. 
And uh, you cannot say that the government will step in and do the, what's right for these people and whatnot, because they'll do what's right for themselves. So I think a lot of people watching this, and I know because I've been so open about my own sort of awakening, are going through this right now. They're mm. realizing that the things that they've been taught for so mm. long are not the, the truth and are not yes. based in fact. When, when that happened to you and you started telling other people, not mm. just the people you were working with, be it family mm. or friends, what kind of pushback did you get? Because it was sort of radical ideas in a way that you were talking about then. Well, I, I, actually, I, didn't, I didn't feel any need to uh, uh, do a lot of, a lot of proselytizing. Uh, it was enough for me that, uh, that I, I was now beginning to understand things I hadn't understood before. And uh, as you've noted in the, in the book, I have, I mentioned minimum wage studies. And really, they're, they're incredibly flawed. Mm -hmm. There's a whole chapter on numbers. Uh, uh, and, and, and the other thing, getting back to my personal development, I mean, I left home when I was 17, uh, no high school diploma, no skills, no job experience, and I discovered that there was not a huge amount of demand for people like that. Uh, but in retrospect, decades later when I do research, I realize that in 1948, the unemployment rate for black 16 and 17-year-olds was 9.4. For whites the same age, it was 10.2. Hmm. And those numbers are, are much smaller than we, we're used to in recent decades. Uh, and, and there's no serious uh, racial difference. In fact, the blacks in, in my age bracket, we're doing just slightly better. Uh, and of course, one of the things that the minimum wage do law does is that it, it creates unemployment, raises it to multiples of what it was. 1948 was a, was a special time because the minimum wage law was passed in 1938, and in the intervening 10 years, there was huge inflation, and the law hadn't gotten changed. And so for all practical purposes, there was no minimum wage law. But had we had these wonderful liberals uh, <laughs> insisting that I be paid a living wage that would support a family of four, I would have been unemployed. And I don't, I don't know what, what, what that would have led to. <laughs> right, it would probably would not have led us yeah. to, to everything else. So when you, when, when you think about the, these wonderful liberals, as you just said, you know, I think there's sort of two lines of thinking. One is that, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Mm. I, I try not to besmirch the- And it's a the, super highway. It's a super highway, exactly. I try not to besmirch their intentions. Uh, but then I think there are people that are either con have confused thinking or have ulterior motives mm. or whatever else. What, what do you think it, it is? As someone that is so based in fact, and we're gonna get to plenty of that fact in a moment, what, what do you think the thinking is, the flaw in the thinking? Oh, I think it's the idea that you don't have to check a good sounding idea against what actually happens. Uh, the whole 19, and there are people to this day who think that the 1960s was just a great period. And, uh, and I'll say to them, do you realize how many uh, good trends, the, 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 the murder rate uh, among uh, black males had gone down, had been going down for two decades. Mm -hmm you know, by 18% in one decade, 22% in the next decade. And in 1960, it suddenly takes a U-turn straight up. And that was not peculiar to blacks or even to the United States. Uh, Pinker's book uh, about, about uh, violence, that, you know, that throughout what the Western world, the, the homicide rates did a U-turn mm -hmm. in the 1960s. So the question is, uh, what actually happens when you put your wonderful ideas to work? Do they produce the kind of thing you thought they were going to produce? Or do they produce all the opposite in many areas? And they produce lots of opposites. Yeah, I I'm glad you mentioned Stephen Pinker. I had him on the show a few weeks ago. Ah, and and yes. I think he's, you know, he's one of the clearest thinkers we have. And you know, his new book, Enlightenment Now, is that things are trending more positively. But even hearing that is, is very hard for a lot of people. Well, it depends on what your baseline is. Uh, uh, Pinker is much more optimistic than I am. Uh, I, uh, I happen to be very pessimistic about the future, but I hope the optimists are right. <laughs> do, you, do you think you're a pessimist by nature? No, but I think uh, having st studied so many things that sounded so good and ended up so bad, uh, it makes me uh, doubt, especially when there are people who are anxious to spout off 
with very little uh, study of what, of what they're talking about. Yeah, we've got a lot of that these days. Do you think that has ramped up? Or, you oh, know, yes. I think social media seems to amplify things, but do you think it's always been that way about just sort of this endless pontificating of people that really don't know what they're talking about? Well, there's always been that, as long as there have been human beings. But the question is the magnitude of it and, and the ability of various institutions to shut out uh, any other viewpoint, and of which the universities are the worst examples. Yeah. That, uh, I mean, when I, when I, when I uh, see the riots when Charles Murray shows up, and I happen to know Charles Murray. I mean, if you can demonize Charles Murray, you can <laughs> demonize anybody. Yeah. I mean, and, uh, and I, I listen to see, what are they going to quote that he said? I've never heard a single quote of it. All the books the man has written, they, they never quote anything he said. Yeah. And a lot of what he said is the direct opposite of what they claim he said. That tells you a little bit about sort of yeah. the state we're in right now. Yeah. So do you, so this, this thing that's happening on college campuses right now mm. that everyone seems to think is, is freezing free speech and, and it seems to be speech, is, speech that's generally thought of as right. So it's mm. conservatives, libertarians, further people on the right than that. Uh, you're saying that's really not a new phenomenon. You, you were kind of facing well, been, well, it was not that bad in the 1950s when I was a Marxist and, and when Senator Joe McCarthy was, uh, Cara was tracking down anybody on the left. But uh, I said whatever I felt like, wherever I felt like it, and I got no such blowback. That's really interesting. So McCarthy's talking about all this stuff, but you had no problem no. being an open No, he, he was in Washington, and I was in Cambridge, yeah. and so be it. Yeah. So you do think something has gotten worse now? Oh, no, there's a number of things. Venereal diseases, for example, were going down at a very steep rate. It was either syphilis or gonorrhea that was one half uh, as prevalent in 1960 as it was in 1950. The, the, the brilliant idea was to bring in sex education, you see, to avoid uh, unwanted pregnancies and so on. And uh, venereal diseases skyrocketed. Unwanted pregnancies, teenage pregnancies skyrocketed. It's amazing that so many people on the left are able to just ignore any facts that go against their theory. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, it just does not... Uh, my, uh, my old mentor at the University of Chicago, uh, Joyce Stigler, argued, however, that uh, economists have very little influence, and what, what they say makes very little difference. And he was giving a talk at the Hoover Institution once, and he said, thanks to years of dedicated work by Tom Sowell, uh, the next minimum wage increase will be five cents an hour <laughs> less than it would have been otherwise. <laughs> Well, that's what's interesting to me is because as I, as I preface this with you, I think that the writings that you've done all these years in these books, they're becoming culturally relevant, maybe in a way that they weren't, I don't even want to say it this way, but maybe in a way that they didn't, weren't economically relevant. Do you understand the, the point there? That I think there's a cultural relevance to all the things that you've done for these last you know, 40 some odd years that seems so actually powerful and impactful to me right now, which is incredible. Well, I, when it comes to impact, that, that's a different the story entirely. I mean, uh, long ago, I stopped uh, uh, accepting invitations to testify before congressional yeah. committees. It's an absolute waste of time. They have made up their minds, and they just want to be able to say they've heard all points of view. Uh, uh, and then it pretty much stops there. That, that's right. And yeah. I, I remember once uh, Kenneth Clark, uh, was, I was debating him, and he was beside himself because of my supposed sinister influence in Washington this, during the Reagan administration. And I told him, if my, if my influence in Washington is all you have to worry about, you are very, <laughs> you are a very fortunate man. Yeah. Because I, have had, I can't think of anything that happened any different than if I had never said anything to anybody. <laughs> You're being very humble, sir. No, I'm just realistic. I mean, I, I, I can't, I, can't uh, a fine thing. I, I can remember testifying before one committee and uh, the audience was so rowdy that the, the chairman had to back bang the gavel to, to, to keep them to shut them down, uh, and and they had put some little tiny thing in in, in the law they were building, uh, and and I would bet the rent money that that provision is is gone now yeah. <laughs> because there are so many people who did who didn't I I was saying that if you're going to help uh, poor kids then give the money to the kids or else you know, provide it for where, wherever they go. Don't turn it over to the institution because they, they will then use it in an entirely different way. Are, are there any examples where the money is turned over to the institution, whatever the institution might be, where it really does work? Are there any aberrations in most there of must, There theories? must be somewhere by the but, law of averages, <laughs> but uh, it is not prevalent. 
Yeah. So a couple times you've mentioned liberals, and one mm. of the things that I talk about on my show often, because I was I was a progressive, mm -hmm. I was I was a lefty. I now call myself a classical liberal, mm. and I've tried to make the point that being a liberal in the traditional sense has very little, if anything, to do with the left anymore. Yes. Are, are there true. any? Do, do you see any sort of meaningful distinction between classical liberal and libertarian at this point? Or, or do you see even, I'll ask you a couple of things at once and you can go any direction. Um, do you see any, are there, do you see a difference, of course, between liberals and the left? I mean, the words have all sort of yeah, gotten Milton muddled, Friedman right? used to always say that he was, he was a liberal, so did Hayek. Uh, and, and, and of course, in, in different countries, the word means different things. I mean, Australia... Uh, if you said you were a liberal, they, they, they would understand what you were saying. But, in a, but a liberal in Australia is different from a, a liberal in the United States. Yeah. So when you say liberal, you, you mean leftist, basically. Yeah, right? in the American sense of the yeah. word. Yeah. Um, do you think there's any sort of real distinction that needs to be made between classical liberal and libertarian? That, that's one of the things that people ask me all the time. And I know you're not big on labels generally, but I did read uh, something where you said that the closest thing that you could be labeled as is libertarian. Do you, mm -hmm. Is that still where you're at? Yeah, except, of course, in foreign policy. We can talk about that, too. And, and, and I, mean, I guess also the, 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 the libertarians seem to have this atomistic view of the world, which I think is uh, completely unrealistic. Yeah, so... That, Oh, go ahead. Because I mean, I mean, not only in my life, but in the, in the, li in the lives of people around me, uh, the surroundings make a huge difference. Uh, one of the things I get into a lot in, in the book is this, the disparities imply uh, either, either discrimination on the one hand or genetic differences on the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and disparities are the norm. I mean, I was just reading something the other day, you know, that uh, Latin America has 8% of the people in the world. They commit 38% of all the murders. Hmm. Uh, and in Latin America... 80%, no, 38% for that. But in Latin America, 80% of the murders occur on 2% of the streets. Wow. So, but, but you find, when you look, look up facts, that's what you find over and over again. Uh, in, in, in all the discussions of uh, income di differences, they, act, they, they never take into account age. And age is huge. I mean, Japanese Americans have a median age of 50. Hispanic Americans has a median age of 26. Now, when you see uh, Hispanic Americans greatly overrepresented among baseball stars, and not a single Japanese American baseball star in the major leagues, I don't believe in the entire history. Yeah. Well, we had Ichiro on CNN. No, 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 no. That was there are people of Japanese ancestry who've been become baseball stars. Yeah. All of them are from Japan. None of them are Japanese American. Ah, okay. Fair enough. Right. He played he was a star in Japan for that, many years. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so 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 how many 50 year old men are going to be baseball stars? Yeah. Uh, and by the same token, <laughs> how many, many. 20, 26 year old men are going to be surgeons or CEOs? Uh, any other kind of job that requires long years of study or, and or long years of experience. And so even if they were the same, if the two groups were the same in every other way, and if there was absolutely no distinction, no discrimination and whatnot, they still, there would be a huge difference in income simply because of age. And, and that really is what this book is about. And, you know, the book itself, it's about 160 pages. But what I loved... You know how many pages of notes you have in there? Do you have, do you know offhand by any chance? Well, I know I know 127 pa pages are text, and the rest of it is notes. Yeah, so you had about 30 some odd pages yeah. on notes, and I actually started going through the notes because I thought this is this is exactly what we need now. We you know like when I was reading it, there were pages that I had to read more than once because mm -hmm. you're obviously giving a lot of numbers and facts, and you have to look at these things from different angles, mm -hmm. and and we're not very good at that these days, right? We're we're sort of we no, look at no. things from one angle, and then and then you start the screaming. And I yeah. think that's what you're, you're, you're really a master of here. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm trying, I try to, but uh, we'll, we'll see how it works out. We'll see. Um, do you make any meaningful distinction between sort of a classical liberal and a libertarian? Is that, is that just sort of... Uh, that, that, that's uh, wholly peripheral okay. as far as I'm concerned. I mean, they're just trying to get a few simple facts across is a full-time job. Yeah. All right. So then let's talk about some of the facts that you lay out in the book. You talk about two types of discrimination. Mm -hmm. uh, could, you, could you lay those out? Yeah. Uh, it, the word ha it has almost opposite meanings. I mean, the first meaning when they say has, someone has discriminating taste, you mean he, he can tell what is a good uh, wine from a bad wine, what is a good camera from a bad camera, and so forth. 
And that's almost the exact opposite of the meaning in, in the law, where you mean someone who uh, judges someone by what group he comes from, irrespective of the individual's actual uh, personal uh, qualities. So th th those are two very different things. Uh, ideally, you would like every person to be uh, judged as an individual, but as a practical matter, uh, that, uh, that becomes impossible because the costs are prohibitive. Yeah, so I use the example where if you're walking down the yeah. street at night and, and uh, you see a shadowy figure in, in, a, in an alley up ahead, I mean, do you judge him <laughs> as an individual or do you cross the street and uh, go across on the other side? Because uh, the, the cost of, of, of judging him as an individual can be very high, including your life. So, uh, so we make that distinction. But then I say, that I call that discrimina discrimination one, one is when you just have a, 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 ver a very good understanding of what the facts are. And so if you judge each person as an individual, I call that dis discrimination 1A. Mm -hmm. And then if you judge them by the group they belong to, that's not as good, but that's discrimination 1B, but it's still based on some facts. Uh, discrimination 2, which is the reason we have anti-discrimination laws, uh, is that you, you don't worry about that at all. If he's s someone that you don't like for whatever reason, uh, then you, 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 uh, you know, you are biased against him. Yeah, are you shocked when you look at what's going on right now and, and see so much talk about race all the time, so much talk about all, oh, of, the, yes. all of the things that separate us, the very things that, that you've been arguing against mm -hmm. based in fact for so many years that seem in an odd way more, I, I don't think there's more racism now mm -hmm. than ever or, or more, more of talk. these dividers, but there's more talk about it. Yes, and, and it's devastating. I mean, uh, w wars in general, are much easier to start than they are to stop. I mean, when when uh, when that uh, fellow in in, uh, in Serbia shot the Archduke, I mean, who knew that that was going to cause millions of people around the world, yeah. including people from the United States, about t about ten thousand miles away, are going to come over there and start shooting. Yeah, the Great War. Yeah, and and you can't get and you get and I'm, not, and I'm worried about the tr current trade war. You start a trade war, you may never be able to stop it in the, in, the, in the next decade. Because there are too many people involved, too many cross currents of interest and so on.